So let's get started. So who's been uh, writing SQL queries before? Yeah. So you already know how to do it, right? I don't have anything to say about it. So that's done. Thank you for very much. Now let's let's get to it. So I've been using PostgreSQL for a long time now. I began like in the previous century. And uh, I'm now working at Citus Data. We do uh, sharding for PostgreSQL. So if you are interested in scaling out, just have a look at what we do. Uh, we have a pretty nice product. And it's no part of the Microsoft family. Um, I've been working on a PG Loader too. So the, the idea behind PG Loader is that if you're using another RDBMS, another relational database management system than PostgreSQL, and you might be interested in switching to Postgres, I know that because you, you are here today, right? So maybe you want to do that. Uh, the idea of PG Loader is that you have no excuses. It's only one common line. Uh, it needs two parameters, like the previous database connection string, the PostgreSQL database connection strings, and then all happens automatically for you. Uh, the data, the schema, the indexes, the constraints, everything is taken care of. So if you are currently having an application using MySQL or SQL Server or SQLite or something else, one command line and you're using PostgreSQL. So just have a look. Okay, so that was to get started. Let's get to SQL queries. Um, the goal of this slide is to mock the, the guy who did that in a presentation, and uh, I feel okay to do that because it was me, so, okay. Uh, to be fair, it didn't appear that, that way. We'll get back to that in a second. But uh, often enough in trainings and uh, conferences and other places, even if you're maintaining some code that is already running in production, uh, you're confronted with a query that, is, that has been already written for you. The, the goal of the talk today is to understand, to try to find a way together. What do you get from a like, scratch, like blank page, there is nothing here, in here yet, to a query like this? Because on the first look, it looks pretty complex. Well, uh, I, I needed to resort to having it on two columns for it to fit on the slide. So it's beginning to get complex. To be honest, though, uh, it's mostly coming from this other a basic query. Uh, can you guess what it does? Maybe not in a whim like this, but basically we generate all the dates for a month and we join with the dates that we have in our fact book so that we can then display uh, the uh, activities, its financial reports. So you get some data and if no activity was recorded on a day, uh, you still have the day that appears in the, in the result, in the listing. So th this one is pretty simple. You just need to know about generate series. Who knows about generate series already? Yeah, most of you. So the, the idea behind it is uh, double in this slide. The first idea is that it allows you to generate some data uh, on the SQL query itself without having to do it in the application. It, it can be pretty nice at times, but the, the, the real kicker here is that we're using it with dates and interval which means that you don't have to know how to process the calendar in your application because PostgreSQL is really good at the calendar. So depending on the date that you attach to generate series here, dynamically, the interval one month is going to be computed correctly. So in February, it's going to be 28 days, uh, but 29 if it's a leap year and things like that. So it, it's very nice to know about it. And to be really fair, the first query of the series was this one which did bring a result that looks like this. But you can see that for February, we only had 90 days of activities, not the full month, hence the more complex query and the next version after it. So I began on purpose uh, with the complex one at the end, because often enough, that's what you're confronted with, right? Or what you want to integrate in your code at the end of the day is something that looks like that. So how do we get from a blank page to something like that? That's the that's my topic today. Uh, we're going to do, uh, it's new for me, so I hope it will uh, work well for everybody. It's going to be uh, mostly interactive. So I don't have that many slides, I will switch to interactive applications. 
before I do that, I'm going to present a data model that is simple enough so that everybody can understand the queries. And then we're going to try and solve some business questions, some uh, use cases, some uh, user stories, however you want to call them. We're going to try and do that together. In case it doesn't work really well with the timings and things, uh, I already have the answers uh, computed already, of course. But uh, we're going to try to do it together. The data model that I found that is um, uh, openly available and uh, easy enough to understand and practice within a short time frame like we have today is related to uh, a Formula One uh, results. So basically, we have the Formula One database with the circuits and drivers and uh, lap times, speed stops, races and results, seasons and things like that. Uh, I, I'm myself, I don't, I'm not a fan of uh, this sport anyway. So maybe you are, maybe you're not. It's not the topic of the, of the talk. We don't care about that so much. But it's pretty easy to understand what's happening. Uh, you have drivers that are driving cars on a circuit, and you measure the lap times, and uh, there is a winner. And so we are going to be able to do many queries around what has happened in the past in the, those laps that have been recorded. And we have the whole history of the Formula One, all the results. It's all in this database. So it's pretty nice as a, an example of data to use together. Uh, just a word about the schema here. Uh, it's really not normalized. I thought about it and I was like, maybe I should normalize the schema because it, it would uh, maybe be better for us to then be able to query it. But at the same time, most people don't normalize properly their schema. So maybe you will hear me complain about the schema being like not done properly while I'm trying to figure out the queries. And I thought it would be a better uh, training for me to complain about the schema not being right so that you have some more clues about why you want to normalize. So let's see if that happens. Uh, so more about the schema. So if I do select star from races limit one, I have one race. It was the Australian Grand Prix in 2009. So that's the first entry. It just appeared like that. And they're uh, nice enough to give you the Wikipedia entry for it. Apparently, this sport is kind of, uh, you know, uh, interesting enough so that every race has a Wikipedia page. No, no. Uh, then we have drivers. With, uh, so we computed dynamically the full name here with the format call. So you know you can do that in SQL, right? You don't have to do it in the application layer. Uh, you can do it right here with the format. Because in the model, we have the forename and the surname separately, and we have also a code. But that's pretty recent, so not every driver has a code. Some of them do, some of them don't. And uh, we also have results. And uh, I introduced a join here because I want to see the, need the number of points that uh, this driver got, got in uh, so how many times he won. So it's going to be interesting for the next part of the, of the presentation. See, the results table, it has a position column. And the position columns is one when the, the driver did win the race. It's a strange model to work with, but that's what we have. So we're going to fetch the results and the, the drivers and the results, and we are going to count how many times a given driver were in position one, like he won the race. Over the whole history of the Formula One, so I think uh, the last time I synced that database was uh, a year and something ago, so it, it was at the time. And uh, see, not everybody has a code. So that's the character I've asked PSQL to display when there is a null, because otherwise it's just a blank string and you, you just see nothing. And uh, usually I don't have that in the data. If you have that a phone in the data, then you want to pick something else, of course, but uh, I like this one. And so that's the, the three drivers in the whole history of the Formula One database uh, at the time of my last sync uh, that won the most points in the whole history of it. So maybe you know, you know those names already. Any questions so far? Are we good to begin with uh, trying to hammer on some queries on the keyboard? Yeah, okay. So. The reason why we type uh, SQL usually is to answer inquiries, either business cases or maybe user stories. And um, 
sometimes just to answer uh, like uh, the marketing guys, uh, they, they, they want to know some more about the data before they can, you know, uh, make some decisions about what's the next interesting thing to do, uh, how to best serve our users and things like that. Uh, maybe you need to put on a dashboard that everybody, when they log in, they have some nice information, pretty well summarized. And we'll have a talk about that later this afternoon, so I won't enter the, too much in the dashboard business. Also, maybe you want to practice. As a developer, if sometimes you have to do SQL, but each time you have to do it, you need to retrain yourself to remember how it works. Then I have a, an advice for you. Try to find a business case or a user story or a, a random question about the data set that you have to work with every day and answer the question in SQL. Like every day you take 10, 15 minutes and you answer one random question in SQL. If you do that each and every day, it's called uh, deliberate practice. And then within some weeks or a month or depending on the, what kind of answers you, you're seeking, you'll find yourself pretty good at SQL. It needs to be deliberate practice. It, it means that you need to focus on it and, uh, and uh, do it in a, with the spirit of learning something new each and every day. First question that we are going to uh, answer together. What about we have this business inquiry? We want to display all the races from a quarter with their winner. So I want one line per race, and for each race I want to know who did win that race. Simple, right? So how do we do that? Uh, yeah, I prepared, so I tricked a little, so I prepared my thing. We're going to say that uh, the quarter is going to be this quarter, starting April uh, 2017, and that's going to be called beginning, it's a variable name, and uh, a quarter is uh, three months usually, so we're going to do that. Um, those lines, if you don't know about it, you can actually use them in psql. So I'm going to switch to psql now. So that's psql. Uh, okay, that works. So we may begin. Everybody can read the text. <coughs> it's saying hello from psql. Okay, no surprises. Uh, before we begin, table races. Okay, I need my fingers to get back on the proper keys. Okay, so who knew that table is a standard SQL command? Ah, oh, not many of you, but some of you. Cool. So you can even say table races limit one, but there is not the whole set of uh, select, just a table. I like that command because it reminds people that um, in the from clause you put a relation and table is just another kind of a relation, and the output of a select query is a relation too. And one of the select queries, the, the less interesting one, is named table. But it could be select star from races limit one. I'm not sure everybody can read that, so let's put it up there. Okay, so that's the races. What we want already is all of the races from this quarter we mentioned. So. See, uh, I prepared a little. Uh, I'm not going to do everything from scratch. So display all the races, set beginning, set month. So now I have the beginning and the month variable. So just to show that to you, I can do select beginning and month. See? I have something. So I can do select star from races where date is greater than beginning and date is before or uh, usually what you do is so I'm going to pretend I'm making a lot of mistakes and sometimes it's for real and sometimes it's not so you figure it out <laughs> so I just wrote a bug can you see the bug usually you do it the other way around so it's not a bug per se but it would be surprising and it would be like uh, we call it a polar violation. Polar is point of uh, least astonishment. So people would be astonished with that way of doing it. So usually you include the beginning date and you exclude the end date. Uh, so we want beginning plus interval. We said three months. But that's dynamic, right? It's uh, one of the properties of my query. So I'm going to do my month times interval one month. Oh, that's interesting. Well, this one I knew it was coming, so I can pretend. 
So I'm going to say to PSQL that beginning uh, is going to be taken as a, a literal value, like a string. And the string is going to represent a value of the data type date. Okay, we call it a decorated literal. And it's not the only one I need to do because I have two of them. This one was not on purpose. And there we go. We have all the races from the quarter, but we don't really care about all the information of every one of them, just the name maybe. Okay, everybody can read that. I'm going to redo it that way. It's okay for everybody to read it. Okay, so just in case you didn't know about that syntax, if I do this, that way, ah, I've lost the letter on the keyboard, no, it's black. Okay, nice. Beginning, maybe it's better that, yeah, please. It's going to be fun, that talk. <laughs> okay. So here I have beginning as string, and uh, PostgreSQL knows nothing about it, so it says it's a column, I guess. And here I say beginning of, but I'm going to say that the, this literal string is of type date. So PostgreSQL, when it parses the query, it already knows it's going to be a date. It's going to validate that it looks like a date, a proper one, not with a year that would be zero, for example, because in our calendar we don't have the year zero. Yes, uh, it started at one or minus one before that. And, uh, and then it's a real date that you can play with. So let's get back to the query. And did we answer our question already? Who remembers about the question we want the answer from? Uh, only me, okay. We want all the races from a quarter, so that part we got, but we also want the winner of every one of them. So who is the winner? Who has been the winner? So, oh, maybe because that's just the name of the circuit, really. So maybe we want the date of the, of the race. I know we want the winner. So the winner, we need to fetch it in the results table. It's going to be the driver who ended up at position one. So if I do, if I get back here, I can do that from races, John results. Can you see that we have a, uh, up there race ID? It's the same column in the races uh, table and in the drive and in the results uh, column, so I can say using. I, I actually lost the end. That's nice. Using races, race ID. Sorry. So the ID of the race, and uh, of course, I went too fast. If I don't add any column, I don't see anything more. So maybe I need the driver ID that is from the results table, and uh, now I have every driver. I don't have those, Oops, sorry, so that you can see. And positions, position is one, right? Oh, now I have only the winner. But it's a little boring with the driver ID. Oh, sorry. So maybe I don't want the driver ID. I want the, I think it was called for name. That's, yeah. And surname. And see, I'm using psql with a setting that uh, means that We've lost part of it, so my trick is usually I, I, I type enter. It's wrong, and I say, yeah, okay, but now I can see what I'm doing. Okay, so, uh, yes, because forename and surname are not in the races table, neither in the results table. So I need to join with the drivers table, and this time I'm going to use driver ID. <coughs> Did I lost uh, N again? Yeah, that's very nice. Thank. I could do that, but it's not fun. So let's make it fun instead and uh, struggle to, through it. No, but so here we go. We have the winner, and we could also because it's more fun with how many points did he win? Points, and there we go. Who's been using PSQL before? Yeah, oh, most of you. So everybody knows backslash e, right? So if I do backslash e, I open the editor with the query, 
so that I have the opportunity, if I want to, to make it like actually look like code that you can read and maintain. Uh, so I'm using my favorite editor, maybe yours is different. And I'm taking my time to do it so that it doesn't appear too magic. Oh, maybe it's better that way. What do you think? <laughs> and now I can quit the editor and have the result again. And it's still in the query buffer. Any question about this first query? So, the, the, so if we get back to the slides for a minute. Oh, that's this query we typed. Fun, right? It's a variation of it, and uh, we will uh, get into it in a, in a second. The, 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 the idea I wanted to convey today, the important bits of it, is that I didn't start with you know, typing exactly that from the get-go. Nobody would. So when, when you see this query uh, in the middle of your, uh, maybe it's a Python script, maybe it's a Java application, PHP, Go, whatever you, you're, you're using, on your daily basis as a developer, or uh, maybe as an ops guy who's doing some code around it. You don't just open a string literal and type this query. Who's ever done like this kind of a query straight in the middle of a Python script without any interactive feedback? Oh, nobody. Oh, yeah. So that's very important. Nobody does that. So that's why putting the query as a string, or maybe you've seen like a in, in many programming languages, you have string builders facilities that allows you to pretend like those things are objects that you can chain together rather than editing a string. It solves no problem for anybody because what everybody is going to do to uh, end up with that query is play with it interactively in the terminal. And when you're happy with it, you're going to integrate it in your code. So the best way to do that is to integrate a .sql file that your code knows or to get and play with. And uh, about the query itself, so we said it was a winner, we renamed the column in that solution. Uh, maybe the race has been entered in the system, but there is no result yet, so it's a left join, because we might have zero entries in results. And also I pushed down the position qualify, qualification here, right into the join so that uh, I join only on the result entries for the winners rather than fetching every one of them and then uh, limiting it. And we fetch the driver and uh, etc. Also, the, the trick that I didn't discover from the get go is that you can use interval one month more than once. You don't need to inject the number of months into the literal string in there because then you, you inject strings into strings and uh, it's, it gets complex. You just say like three times interval one month. It's the same thing as interval three months. So, so, which, which means that the static part of the query is always the same and the dynamic part is really well known and it's an integer and it's easy to handle. Any questions so far? No. That's yet another way to write it. Uh, we could inject the position filtering right into a subselect. Another one to do would be uh, the top three drivers per, by decade. So that's more interesting. Let's see if I have enough time to do it today. So rather than using psql, this time I'm going to use OmniDB. And uh, as you can see, I, I, I'm, yeah, it's already uh, already, but that's not that fun. So. Let's open a new query tab. So what's a decade? It's 10 years, yes. So select date from races, maybe date and name from races. So, and uh, I'm not sure you can read everything down there, but it's going to be, yeah. We'll do our best anyway. And so the decade would be, for the fir first entry year, it's 2009, so the decade would be 2000s. Uh, another one would be 2019, and it would be the 2010s. So how do we get the decade year? Well, we can uh, date trunk 
So we, uh, yes, we can truncate the date to a random precision in PostgreSQL. And guess what? This should work if I remember to do it correctly, which is not that way. And I'm missing a comma here. And I'm missing something else. Oh, so what did I do for what did I do the other time around? Oh, it's that syntax again? No. So I'm going to do a last time. Yes, okay. Otherwise I was going to just copy paste from here. Here. Yeah, see. I've done it already, but anyway. So that's the decade. You can see it here. 2009, and it's in the 2000s. But I just want 2000. I don't want the rest of it. So now that I did truncate the date to, to another one, I can extract. <coughs> and this time it's here from and the date trunk. And I'm going to say that it's the decade column. And because I'm using now a, a more uh, interactive tooling, I can just reformat as I go without switching to the editor. But it's just uh, a matter of uh, being used to your tooling. So that's why I insisted on using two different tooling because some people prefer to have something more visual like this. And some people prefer the very interactive uh, ripple facility that PSQL offers. There is not, for me in, uh, at least, there is not a clear winner in between those two tools. It's just people are different and they need different tools. That's it. So that's why we have so many tools. So I would usually use PSQL and Emacs. Uh, OmniDB is pretty nice and there are other tooling. So just pick the one you're comfortable with. And so we have the decade now, um, but uh, with a uh, it's not perfect, see dot zero at the end, because extract always returns a float. I don't care so much about the, the, it being a float, so, okay, 2000s. Okay, so now I have the decades. So what we want is the top three um, drivers per decade. So from races, I need to join with results and we know that we're going to use, yes, remember, race ID. race ID. And we need the drivers, this time using driver ID. <coughs> and uh, we're going to, we need the, we are interested into the winners. So how do we get one and three per driver in such a query? You group by the driver ID, right? But this, uh, maybe I need to extend it so that we can see everything. This won't make it. We need to have at least the surname of the driver. And because we did group by, maybe we want to have the sum of the points of the driver. And uh, yeah, so maybe that's from races. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, goodbye. Uh, well, I don't care about the race anymore. He's right. See? Reading error messages, that's cool. That's how you do it. And, uh, uh, so this, yeah, we, we can do that for now, but it's not the, and we don't, we don't care about that. And surname, yes, we do. And surname is from driver ID, but uh, I didn't realize that, so we're going to help it. Okay, so in the top driver from the 70s was named Breeze. No, it's not true, it's one of them. So we need maybe to order by points. Ah, it's perfect. Desk. So it's sum of points. So that's more like it. Hamilton in the 2010s had that many points, etc., etc. 
But we don't have the top three per decade. How do we do that? It's a little uh, more involved than that, right? What we would want to do is to somehow here limit three because I want the top three, so I want to limit three. Oh, yes, I only have three of them. But now it's uh, for the whole time of the history of the thing, I have the three drivers who had the most points in, the, in a single decade. But I don't have the three of them per decade. So I need to somehow inject this condition. And because we are late on the schedule, I think, I need to, yes. So what you do when you want to do that is that you need to inject the query we were writing as a subquery. So we're going to do this. Yeah, okay, okay, it doesn't work that way. So we're going to inject so the sum, the po sum of the points, group by order by sum of the points, desk limit three. We had that already, right? We were doing that. What we're going to do is we're going to use that as a subquery and we're going to inject a decade into it so that we can limit three for each different decade. So remember, that's how you compute the decade, right? Everybody remembers about that? It's okay. Because the, the, the date raises the dates, that's the date of the race. So we extract the decade and we, uh, this subquery is only running where the decades is the one from the outside of the query. And the one from the outside, no, you can see it. So we begin with extracting all the decades from the races, and then we're going to inject them in a loop. And for each of the decade, we're going to fetch the three drivers with the most points, okay? So I wanted to do that more interactively, but uh, I guess we're going to run out of time if I actually do that. So I'm just going to show that to you. The results, maybe you cannot see it from the back, but I didn't find a, a way to make that font bigger. So you need to trust me. So that's 1950, Fangio. Uh, and then you have Moss and Ascari. And then it's 1960, Hill, Clark, and Braban, and et cetera, et cetera. OK? So that works. Uh, while I'm there, see there is a, that's run the query. That's explain the query. And OmniDB is pretty nice in the explain output, because you can see the explain output. And uh, there is a red bar on the thing that you should focus your attention on if you want to improve the query. And you can even explain analyze that way. And now you have more red bars. So that's where you need to try and figure out what's happening, like a flame graph for performances and things like that. So I know there, there are like online tools like Depeche.com and things like that, but I found out that this one is pretty nice and well integrated. That's also why I picked OmniDB to do the, the demo today. So explain, explain, analyze, and you know, just run the query. Maybe fetch the results as CSV to send, or Excel to send uh, to your marketing department, or things like that. Pretty nice tooling. Um, any question about either the query or the methodology to get there? I skipped a little on it, I'm sorry. Uh, questions? Not yet? OK, who's done a left join lateral? ever before. Ah, nice. It's a nice crowd that we have in uh, PostgreSQL communities. One question over there. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, what's your feeling about distinct? I tend to put it uh, every time. So yes, that's... distinct is a very nice trick when you don't know what you're doing. Right, <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> yes. So, so how, to do, how to know what you're doing? Well, you practice. Distinct is a good answer when uh, you're not really sure why you don't have exactly the result you want to, and uh, PostgreSQL is pretty good as having, uh, at, uh, implementing distinct. So sometimes you actually need it, but most of the times uh, when I've been consulting with uh, customers, when they use distinct, it's always been because uh, some guy didn't realize it was a group by. So I'm a little harsh on it, I'm sorry. No but uh, sometimes you really need it. 
So I'm sure that you, you've been using it when you needed it, that's for sure. And sometimes it's just because the specifications of the query are not clear enough. So playing with a distinct uh, interactively to figure out what's happening, it's a very nice way to make progress, so that's cool. And um, then when you know what you want, uh, rather than keeping the distinct solution, which is working, so it's pretty nice already, usually it's um, useful to step back and review the specification of the result you want to obtain and think about it in a, in a more uh, SQL way. Uh, it's very difficult to do at the beginning because to be fair, um, it requires lots of training to be able to think in SQL. So distinct is a good uh, trade-off when you're not uh, that comfortable yet with thinking in SQL, but you still want to obtain the result. So uh, for me, it's a very good uh, step towards reaching uh, the right result. And uh, it's um, where I found it mo most useful is when you don't understand the question. And uh, we are very, very lucky with the computers doing uh, programming stuff that uh, we have interactive tools to understand the questions. We don't need to understand the question before we find an answer for it. We can just play around until we find something. And usually by the time you find something interesting, you have a, grasp, a better grasp of the question. So yes, it's a good for interactive discovery. Other questions? And do you have any tips with a tool like this one? to avoid any specific um, PSQL or any other database uh, features and only use uh, pure SQL uh, features? Okay, so pure SQL that doesn't exist. To be exist. independent from uh, any, uh, yeah. any uh, database so system. I, I have a trick, but I'm not sure if it's going to be generally useful, but it's my own trick. I only use PostgreSQL. <laughs> okay. Because it's the best out there, so why should I bother? But uh, other than that, uh, there is a SQL standard, but there is not a single product that is compliant fully with the SQL standard anyway. So uh, doing SQL or using tools that are... Uh, uh, so this tool, I think, is able to connect to more than PostgreSQL. But the, then the SQL that you're going to write is not going to work uh, the same way with different engines. So first, in terms of semantics. So not everyone has implemented left join lateral which, by the way, is very strange in that uh, line here, because the join is implemented in the where clause in the subquery. So here, you join on true, but that's SQL standard. And uh, so not every engine has that. And if your SQL engine, which is not PostgreSQL, doesn't have left join lateral, what do you do next? So the writing the query is a whole different exercise. It's very different. So. Uh, I'm, the, the use cases where you actually need the same query to run on PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, and something else, uh, I don't know a lot of them. It's usually, mostly it's because you're a vendor of a product and the customer is going to choose the RDBMS, you're not. It would be the only case where you're interested into that. And I would argue for uh, uh, having like variants of queries maintained in the database. It would be much easier to have per engine writings of the same query that then you can maintain and optimize separately, than having the same query that runs about the same everywhere, but then you need to care about performances. And performance characteristics of different engines are going to be very different. So that would be my answer. Vic, we have another question, I think. Stephanie there. So I will show you later on that there is uh, a way to achieve, achieve this by just using Postgres in my later talk. Ah, yes. So that's very easy to solve. You only use Postgres, but you query different databases. Yeah, with a foreign data wrappers. Yes. We're going to see that. I was already worried about timing, so I'm going to switch back on the slides. So that's the query we ended up with. Oh, there is another thing in there. Rank over partition by decade or the per points. Everybody knows how to read that. It's called the window function. Who's been doing window functions before? Yeah, most of you. Nice. Nice audience. For the other guys, if you don't know how to use that, you don't know SQL. <laughs> That's it. it. It was, you know, it came into the SQL standard, which means it was already implemented at least by one implementation. In 1992, I won't have you raise hands, but I'm, I'm sure, oh, I'm not sure, but 
Maybe some of you guys in there were not born yet in 92, maybe, I don't know. And, uh, you know, it's the same year as uh, IPv6 or Unicode, like things that everybody is using every day, right? So you don't have any excuses, just if you don't know window functions, if you don't know left zone lateral or things like that, or uh, oh, this is simple enough. Please review your SQL, it's been evolving. It's 2016, the last uh, standard. So please uh, update yourself. Uh, I had another uh, one. We're going to just uh, see it. I don't think I have any time left to uh, do it interactively, this one. And uh, is it ready to run? Seems to be. So, oh, what did I do? I think I clicked, pressed too hard. So we have here, can you see that? For each driver, the number of points, and then for each constructor, the number of points in the same query. So we have two groups, two different groups, in the same group by clause. So who knows how to do it? It's easy, it's written on the, on the, on the screen. <laughs> so you can just pretend and read it out loud. Oh, it was hidden. So let's. So this having close was just there so that I would have less lines of result and I could copy paste it into my slide, otherwise it's too many of them. But maybe not everybody is familiar with having, so you can limit the number. It's like a where clause that applies within a group. And I'm going to do something here. If I do that, oh, what happens? Wow, no, I have also the, the grand total of points for drivers and constructors in the same query. Each time a, a driver wins a race, it accumulates points for himself, but also for the constructor, because it's what the game is mostly about. And um, there is another way to write this grouping set. Who knows how to do it? You can say group by grouping sets. Uh, no, cube, directly cube. And uh, drivers. That's her name. Constructor. That name, and I think. Uh, ah, thank you guys. I need to comment that out. And see, it's the same thing. So we have cube, and we also have rollup, which is. In that case, the same thing, but depending on the list of things that you put there, it can be different. In that case, it's the same thing because you only have two dimensions, but when you have three or more, cube and rollup are going to do different things uh, in terms of the intermediate sums that are available out of the query. And with the grouping set way of writing it, you can uh, give uh, every group you're interested in to manually. Uh, with cube, it's going to do the whole thing for you automatically, like all the possible, uh, basically, Cartesian product of the intermediate sums, and uh, roll-ups only in one direction, from the outside to the inside. And with grouping sets, you can do whatever you want to, okay? Who knew you could do, like, sums of different groups within the same query? Ah, less of you, so I got you. So uh, that's also, uh, grouping sets is a, uh, is not so recent a feature in the SQL standard. It's pretty recent in PostgreSQL implementation, to be fair. But um, in, uh, I think you can still use some supported PostgreSQL version that don't, that don't have it. But soon enough, you won't have uh, the opportunity to say, I didn't know it existed, because it was released in every supported PostgreSQL release. So anyway, just it, it's nice to practice those random questions uh, to learn uh, new SQL tricks. And so here is the query that we just uh, played with. And uh, remember, we did grouping sets. That's the manual way to build up the intermediate results exactly as you want them. And you also have cube and uh, roll up. Any questions so far? OK, good. While I'm there, I'm going to uh, show a couple of uh, other uh, queries, other things that you can do with PostgreSQL very quickly because we're soon out of time. So you can do geolocation right into PostgreSQL. Why would that be interesting, you ask me? 
So Geolite, for example, is providing uh, drivers that you can integrate with the data set already in PHP, Go, Python, Java. Whatever your application is written in, you, you can have a, an easy way to integrate it. What's not easy is to then join the geolocation information with the rest of your database. Because now you, your application needs either to fetch all the data and then filter it, or send the geolocation somehow and then filter it in the database. How do you do that? How do you do that? You do it that way. So you can integrate the Geolite, for example. Um, it's uh, free, but you need to say each time you use it that it comes from MaxMind, which I just did. So I'm compliant with the license. And uh, you can give an, an IP address, for example, that fits in a range, and find the geolocation information that goes with it. And this operator might look new for you, maybe not, maybe yes. You can read it contains. Another way to spell it in PostgreSQL would be with the at sign and greater than. The first time you were introduced to the equal sign, it makes no sense that it's you know, two horizontal bars, or the greater than sign, it makes no sense either. So this one makes no sense exactly as the other ones. It's just, you need, you need to get used to it. So that's geolocation right into PostgreSQL. Uh, the extension that we are going to use to do that is IP4R. Despite the name, it supports uh, IPv6, of course. Um, the, when you do that, a very nice thing to use in PostgreSQL is constraint exclusion, not to be uh, taken as an exclusion constraint, which is something completely different. So constraint exclusion is the ability that you have to, to spell out like, it's like a unicity constraint. You want unicity over your data set. You want IP ranges to be a kind of unique, but uh, unique for a range because it's two dimensional. Um, that's a different way to spell it. So what you want to avoid is overlapping data. So you exclude any data in there that would be uh, overlapping with an existing one. Okay, so this operator now is spelled overlaps, and so you exclude any line that would overlap. It's like unicity. If it's equal, I don't want it. In that case, if it's overlapped, overlapping, I don't want it. So it means that here, because you have a single IP address and you know that there is no overlap possible, you will only get one result. Okay. Um, so then you can use this query in a greater query, so that's what I told you before. Uh, now that you have that in PostgreSQL, you can actually join against the rest of your schema. And the rest of the schema here is a list of pubs that I extracted uh, from um, OpenStreetMap. It was for a conference in Dublin, so it's all the pubs in the UK. And the IP address was the IP address of the hotel in the conference, of course. Because after having you know, talked for a couple hours, you're really thirsty, so you want to find the next pub. So here is how to do it in PostgreSQL with the distance operator that gives you a result in miles. And uh, this other one is distance also, but it's like a Euclidian, a Euclidian distance that, like you do at school when you're a kid. So the, the number of the output, uh, you don't know uh, how, much, how far away it is really, but you know if it's closest or uh, not so close. Okay, and uh, this order by distance limit 10 is called KNN. K is uh, 10 in that case, and it's the 10 nearest neighbors. So in the literature, we call it KNN, and you can find many different search solutions that offers KNN, but of course in PostgreSQL, it's just order by limit. That's it. And now you have an index only scan that gives you like all those pubs. I think on my laptop at the time, some years ago, it took like two to three milliseconds to get the 10 uh, nearest pubs. So I didn't have much time to get thirsty at all anyway. And uh, I think I have enough time to go through that one, which is always fun. That's from an article uh, where they were so happy to introduce uh, MongoDB abilities for um, uh, aggregates. You know, MapReduce was uh, uh, back into uh, being uh, something uh, people wanted to do, rediscovered like some years ago. And so they loaded all the NBA game statistics, which are uh, open data and available as a JSON uh, set of data, and they, uh, they said an interesting factoid, the team that recorded the fewest defensive rebounds in the win. Defensive rebounds in basketball is that you try to make a point, you fail, the guy steals the ball from you and then win a point. So defensive rebound, the guy tries to do something and you, you're in defense, 
you get the rebound and then you can attack. So usually when you do that, you have uh, way more points than the other guys. And they said, okay, there is only one game where they won despite having the less possible rebounds in the whole history of the ABA. And I was like, what's interesting in fact is that they missed um, showing us the query. So I did it in SQL, which is, it's easy and simple, it fits on a slide. And uh, it's actually four games, I'm sorry. So I don't know about MongoDB stat statistics functions and uh, aggregates, but you know, I just use PostgreSQL. And uh, I'm out of time, so I won't explain it, but it's really easy. That is the, the interesting part of the query. This is just fetching some data dynamically, min and max. And that is just a, con like, you know, MVC, model view controller. That's the view. So I repeat this Unicode character that many times. And so I know that 14 rebounds is uh, really something weird in NBA games. Usually it's between 25 and 35. And you can do that just on psql. No need to learn uh, d 3 gs or something uh, very you know, interesting. And everything from here is taken from my book. You can have it uh, with a 15% discount today if you want to. And that's it.